just clicked and we are recording. Thank you very much and hope that's okay for everybody. So welcome and thank you very much for coming. Um, it uh, dawned on me that something that would be interesting to discuss is to look at what is a coach. I mean, I suppose it could also be who is a coach, but um, what is a coach is the question. And we've got this um, great uh, group of panelists, thank you for coming together, who will um, give their perspective of that question. And I'm sure there'll be quite an eclectic mix of opinions and um, opening, oh, and there's one more person in the waiting room. Um, and um, just to look at sort of the wider question of what is a coach. Um, for those of you who don't know, there's Jen McEwen, Lynn Walker, John Musgrave, Mark Nixon and myself are the panelists. The way we're going to operate tonight will be uh, one presenter at a time, about 10 minutes each, and then some questions and answers after that, and then moving on to the next panelist. So that's the format we're going to have. As the presenter is, um, you know, giving their spiel and discussing their topic, could you please just write your questions in the, the chat room and we'll get to them um, at the end of their presentation. So I hope that makes sense for everybody and um, hope you enjoy it all. Um, if there's nothing else to add, I would say, Lynn, are you happy to go ahead? Yes, okay then, all right, I'll just uh, get my share screen up and then get going. Um, let's just see, okay. And get back up. Okay, Denise, can you just confirm that you can see the PowerPoint yes. all right? Yes, it's good. all good. Okay then, all right, thanks very much indeed. Okay then everybody, I'll first of all introduce myself. My name's Lynn Walker. I'm a member of BASOC, which is up in the Highlands of Scotland in Strathspey, where we have some of the best orienteering areas in the UK within about 30 minutes drive. We can go up to the Murray Coast. We've got our wonderful Speyside forests as well. My background is in education as my daytime job, but I've always been interested in developing coaches and developing athletes as well. And I particularly really enjoy working with adults in the field of coach education and development. I don't know if that's a bit of a spin off from having worked with secondary pupils for most of my life as well. Okay, so let's think, what do our athletes want? Well, our athletes tend to want to reach for the stars. It can be fairly close by stars or it can be far away stars like Thierry Georgiou when he was very young said he wanted to be world champion and he actually got there as well. But you don't just get to the stars just by wishing for it. You actually usually have to serve an apprenticeship and the apprenticeship being made up of training and learning, practicing, and then going out and working on it. And this is really where the coaching comes in. The coach can help the athlete reach for their personal stars. I think we have to recognize that not all great athletes can be good coaches and not all great coaches are performance athletes. But could we actually use something like this that the coach wants to be the best they can possibly be, reaching for their personal stars, and what is their apprenticeship? What does it actually look like in the field of coach education and development? <clears throat> so I'd like to start with a fairly commonly used analogy of serving an apprenticeship as a carpenter. Now, I've gone along and I've got some basic skills in making my chair. And I think you'll agree that they're very basic, but it's functional, it's not very comfortable, and it's not very stylish, but I can sit in it, I'm not sitting on the ground anymore. But through my apprenticeship of learning and training, working, advice from mothers, and practicing, I get better. And I get a more serviceable chair, slightly comfier, looks a little bit more stylish. And I still keep working through the learning, training, advice and practicing, and I eventually become a pretty good craftsman and I make this chair. And people have helped me along the way, like a coach would help you. I've worked on the craft, I've asked people questions, and very importantly, I've had somebody mentor me. Now you could consider the mentor to be uh, somebody who's guided me and he's helped me learn 
or develop a bit faster than I would have done without them. Another important thing is customer feedback. Is what I'm doing working for them? And I might find that this excellent chair that I think is really good, I've reached the pinnacle of my crafting career, is actually rubbish. Nobody wants it because it's too uncomfortable to actually sit on. Now, when you're dealing with something like carpentry, it's fairly easy. You've got a product at the end. You can see the progress that I am making as a carpenter as I go through all of this. In some ways, it might be a little bit harder when we look at our coaches and how they're working on their craft of coaching. So let's now take this analogy from the carpenter to the coach and let's think a little bit about what might be a journey that's involved in the coach. Sorry about that, I just um, have pressed the wrong button again. There we go. Okay, so I'll just go on to my next slide quickly. Okay, so to the coach. So what we've got, we've got the athlete that the coach is working with or the group of athletes the coach is working with. We've got the coach, we've got the apprenticeship elements here of the learning, the training, the practicing and the working on it. But I think there's quite a bit more to the coach than that. I think that's maybe more of our traditional model of how we've approached our coach education. And we haven't really addressed this person as the coach. How can we address this person as the coach? Well, I think we've got to look at the coach themselves and what might they actually bring with them. And I think some of this will overlap with a bit of what Jen's going to talk about later. But let's think a little bit about some of the life skills that the coach probably already has to an extent, some will have more, some will have less, some will have unequal size circles here, but does that matter? Think about their cognitive things that they're bringing with them. Problem solving. Can they observe the athlete and analyze what the athlete is doing? And then can they communicate with the athlete through questioning to find out a little bit more and then make decisions about what they're going to do to help that athlete develop, what kind of exercises they might put on for the athlete to develop. What kind of self-awareness do they have? And you know, are they good at working, particularly as a team? Can they work with a team of athletes? Can they work with a team of coaches, with a team of helpers? What are they bringing along to this coaching situation with them? It's not just those life skills, which I'm sure Jen will be going into later. It's this, and I really like this little quote that I found, and it comes from Elvis Presley. Values are like fingerprints. Nobody's the same, but you leave them all over everything you do. And a lot of the coach's values come through their nonverbal communication, you know, how they're communicating with everybody else they're working with, whether it's athletes or other coaches. But I think that we have to recognize that the coach will leave these, this imprint onto the other people. And finally, is the coach curious? Do they actually have this kind of desire to learn more, that they just want to dive into their mystery box, rip off that tape and find out what's inside? Are they driven by things that they do for themselves or are they driven by external things? So along with the traditional ways of learning, training, practicing and working, think about the coach themselves and how through coach education and development, we can enrich what this coach is giving to us. Because I think we've also got to remember this coach is a volunteer and what are they going to get out of it? And 
from quite a few of the coach education courses I've run, people have said, I've been able to transfer some things from this course into my day-to-day -day life. And it's actually helped me there. So we have quite a few challenges, don't we? And I think the first challenge I'd like to lay down to you all is, do we know what the clubs and the athletes want to need in terms of the coaches? Are we producing the product at the end that is worthwhile? And if you think about the analogy of the carpenter and the chair, that chair that they produced at the end wasn't what the customer wanted. Coach development. Is it driven by extrinsic things? Like for instance, first aid. We have to renew our first aid every year. Tomorrow night, I'm going to be sitting on a call doing my child well-being and protection and sport course that I'm going to have to be doing every three years. So those are external things that I actually have to do and are meant to be helping my development. But what am I doing for myself? What is driving from me, from the intrinsic side, from inside me, right? This curiosity, this desire to learn. Are we encouraging our coaches to it? Do we know what our coaches actually want? Do we need to start to think about changes in coach education and development? We're coming to a fairly critical time in terms of coach education, which is the time of the qualification needing to be revamped. How are we going to revamp it? What are we going to do? Are we going to address these challenges? Are we going to take advantage of the things we have developed because of COVID-19, not in spite of it, but because of it, that we've managing to work together in ways we never thought we could. And let's not view things as challenges, but let's go for the opportunities that they are providing us for, for the development of coaches and their education. Thank you very much for listening to this. Okay, thanks for that, Lynn. Um, I will now have a look at the chat. There's no, no comments on the chat yet. <laughs> Would people like to use the chat, the button at the bottom of the screen, and um, put any questions that you might have there? And make them to everyone. Stunned. <laughs> I can, I, I'll start off with one. Um, have we, you talked about the possible, the need for change and the fact that we're at the stage when we could be changing. Have we started to investigate the change? I'll ask you that since you have been involved with a lot of the development <laughs> of, of people. Yeah. Um, I, I can only speak for the situation in Scotland because that's the situation I'm involved in. And I think that we have started to investigate the change here because we're starting to look at our level two course. A few years, well, two or three years ago, and Hilary Quick can keep me right here, she, the level one was rewritten. And so it came away from the UKCC. For level two, we're in the process of looking at it and rewriting it. And we started with the premise of what do the clubs need a level two coach to be able to do and to examine from there what, how does the education course then need to look. But I don't know if we're actually looking enough at the, the kind of coach value within that as well. And it's, it's quite hard to think, how do we actually look at the coach value and how we can increase the value of coaching for the people involved in it? I think maybe that's through the development because through the coach education, they have to pass by all these hoops so that there's equivalence between qualifications. Um, it, it is a difficult one. We yeah. can't just do what we want to do. Yes. Okay, um, there's, there's a few questions come up. Um, one of them 
uh, from Wendy was about how do coaching and leadership overlap. That one we could possibly leave till later once we've had Jen and, uh, and Denise talking more about their, their aspect. Um, what, uh, from Ian, Ian Hendry, how do you see what you've said is relevant to beginner coaches? Although okay, that, 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 that's actually quite yeah. a, good, a good one, that's Ian, because I've just... For novice coaches. Yeah, I'm in the process of doing a level one course at the moment, and they, from, from looking at it and from kind of working with them, they're bringing a lot to the course. And so that there's less maybe educator speak, but more encouraging them to contribute to what, what's actually happening. And I think that's, you know, we need to improve our skills as educators so that we're, we're making sure that those on the course are the ones who are doing as much talking as possible and gaining as much from one another and creating learning communities that way, if we can. Okay. <clears throat> right. Um, I think we, we need to be moving on now, given time, um, time limitations. Um, so we're moving on now to my presentation, which I entitled, after a bit of thought, Poacher to Gamekeeper. Um, my, my background in orienteering was I started at school in 1977. Um, very, very quickly, I got into the Scottish Junior Squad in 1978, the British Junior Squad in 1980, and the, the British Senior Squad in late 1980, which was a big surprise for me. Um, I ran World, ran World Cups from 1986 onwards, um, three World Championships, 93, 95, 97, and I retired from top level competition in 2001. I started coaching almost as a parallel in the late 80s, I think it was, helping Derek Allison at the Highland School of Sport. Um, and I moved on through various stages of coaching. Uh, moved on to the old Boff Level 5 national coach at 2006. Uh, I was the, part of the GB uh, coaching team for the development squad from 2000 to 2008. And the last two and a half years, I've been coaching the Scottish Junior Squad. Um, and it's largely from the development, the British development squad coaching and the Scottish Junior Squad that I'm presenting this. Um, so poacher and gamekeeper, the poacher is the athlete. They're self-centered, they're performance focused and they're blind to others' needs or wishes. They want what they want and they want it now. Um, whereas the coach needs to look to the needs of others. They need to be team-centered. Um, they need to predict problems and solve clashes um, between team members, also between staff members and staff and team clashes. Um, and I also believe they need to teach self-reliance self and self-resilience. Um, and ultimately, and I think Mark might mention this later, um, the aiming for self-coaching athletes. So that was my sort of initial view of athletes and coaches. And then I worked through, started jotting down some, some of the lessons from and my 40 years of orienteering, competing and coaching. Um, number one, I believe the best will get to the top anyway, with or without support. But with a good coaching support, it's quicker, easier, and a lot less painful. Um, when I look back at the lessons I learned, I'm sure that with more coaching, like we have now, uh, things would have been, I'd have made fewer, slightly fewer mistakes. Working as part of a team provides much faster and better learning um, with the proviso that there needs to be an avoidance of uh, too many conflicts. Um, and that's a team of coaches as well as a team of athletes. I don't believe any one coach can cover all aspects. Um, and to be honest, one person, one coach can't coach more than four or five athletes at a time. Third point, learning from other athletes is at least as important as learning from coaches. So getting the athletes 
training together in different groups as, as much as possible so that they see other people, they, they learn from them, they can talk about what they saw in the forest and so on. I think the athletes learn as much from that as they do from, from some, a coach telling them. Training needs to be fun. The, lo the longer I stay involved in, in or interior coaching, the more I believe that. And I believe that even for the top juniors. Um, there's no point putting on really serious sessions for the top juniors if, if they're not enjoying it. They will go away. Even if the top class athletes, they will find something else that's more fun. Um, allow plenty of downtime at training weekends. Relaxing, socializing with the friends. Some of them might even do some personal analysis, but probably most of them not. So short intensive sessions, but plenty of downtime. And one of the things about COVID that has struck me, we don't need to have um, uh, lectures and uh, session, extra non orienteering sessions at training weekends. We can hold them on any night in the week. Um, so we don't have to get the athletes back showered, cleaned up, eaten, tidied up, and then they have to sit down for an hour listening to someone telling them about fitness training or about sports psychology. We can do that separately. And to me, that's, that's, that's a, big, a, big, uh, a big bonus. We can keep the weekends for orienteering and socializing. Um, next one, avoid too many rules too rigorously applied. Uh, there need to be boundaries, but Certainly what I've, what I've um, learned over the years is that orienteers are generally fairly responsible. And if you trust them, um, then that trust will be repaid. Provide opportunities for learning. There's both technical orienteering and also other as aspects like sports science, life skills, which in the Scott Joss weekends includes cooking, tidying up, cleaning up and so on. I'm not sure how much some of them some of them do it at home, but they have to do their turn. Um, to facilitate the learning by using uh, lots of different styles and systems and techniques, so that the juniors will find some way that they can pick things up, um, and also some aspects that will be useful for them. Offer a variety of technical training. In, in as many different terrains and different disciplines as possible um, so that they get used to a variety. Uh, planning, planning courses and hanging markers, to me, ideally, would not be part of Scott Joss' lead coach role. It often is. Um, maybe there's a session I particularly want to do or maybe there's, there's, a, there's a, a lack of, of, of local orienteers. But as much as possible, I'll ask the local orienteers to do it. They don't need to be a coach. They can just be a reasonably technical, technically competent orienteer who's happy to plan some sessions, courses and hang some controls um, and save the coach's energy for actually coaching. Um, referring back to another one, uh, uh, one point I made earlier, junior orienteers are almost all pleasant individuals. And I think I'd, uh, I'd say almost without exception, they're people I enjoy being with. Uh, so aiming to try to further enhance this. Um, try new things out. Um, when I started at Scott Joss, one of the first weekends we did was a sprint end. So we had three sessions, two on the Saturday and one on the Sunday, totally dedicated to sprint orienteering. Um, and certainly for me, it was one of the most interesting, se interesting sessions I've done because it was totally new to me, um, the sort of challenges and, and, and the, uh, the style of orienteering and so on. And then follow up with what works. Um, there's no point pushing on if things aren't working, if the athletes aren't enjoying it or anything. And finally, um, satisfaction for athletes and coaches is essential. Um, but it comes from many different outcomes. When I started orienteering coaching, I was always thinking, oh great, I want to coach someone who goes to the world champs. I want to coach someone who can win a medal. But for some, it might be getting to jaywalk. For some, it might be winning a medal at jaywalk. For others, it might just be staying in the sport. Uh, and realistically, the numbers involved at junior level are always far higher than 
uh, even junior team level or certainly senior team level. So we have to look wider than just ultimate competitive success. <clears throat> so those are my 13 points. Um, I, I will send a note to Denise with these on, so afterwards you should be able to uh, look through them in a bit more detail. Ready for some questions, John? Yep. We've got an absolute filter from Suzanne Robbins Birds. John, what's your top tips for making it fun? Short, <laughs> short exercises. Um, listen to the athletes and make sure that you, you're not pushing them too hard. Uh, it's very easy to plan or to get 16, 20 kilometers of orienteering planned, but, and the athletes, young and keen and enthusiastic, will do as much as they can and then they'll collapse. So generally keeping thing, things short. Um, also making sure that we have plenty of downtime so they, they're not just feeling that they're being worked, worked, worked the whole time. Um, for, for a lot of the Scott Joss members, the social aspect is what's keeping them there, what's keeping them interested. If we lost that, I'm sure we'd lose half the juniors. Um, so, yeah, short oh. exercises and lots of, lots of downtime. I was going to add on to that. So there's a kind of difference between sort of the organic fun of just a bunch of teammates that you have at Scott Joss um, doing their own thing versus organized fun, which might be, you know, like you setting up things. I don't know. It could be five aside football or, or exercises. Do you, like, do you do that sort of more organized fun or you just kind of let them off the leash for an hour and see what happens? Usually we just let them off the leash. And if there's, if there's a river nearby, they'll sometimes go swimming. <laughs> If there's a sweetie shop near Brad, they'll go to the sweetie shop. <laughs> but um, I think if there was a, well, we should have had a, a Scott Joss summer tour last summer, and we would have had a lot more um, sort of, shall I say, structured non orienteering activity. Um, but uh, generally, I found that the, the juniors are fairly good at entertaining themselves. Okay, and there's another question from Carol N. L. Uh, John, do you have a feel for how many follow your signposts, such as here are some videos or articles to look at, or do you have to put it in front of them? And I'll add on to that. And does it matter if not all of them see it as well? I Occasionally, if I see some, some article I particularly like, I'll, we'll, we'll spread it around the juniors. I generally don't follow up on that. Um, I also occasionally send articles to some of the older juniors that I think might be of use to them. Um, and in those, if that's an individual email, I'll often get a response. In terms of the blanket emails, we have about 34, 35 juniors in the squad this year. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect to get 34 answers. And if I did, it would, it would clutter up my email box. And in a way, it doesn't matter because the energy in sentence, the energy taken in sending out a link is the same whether it's one person or, th or 40 people. And so if one person picks up something from that link, then that's been successful. And in a similar way, things like the sports science that, that we're, we've, we've had and we're, we're carrying on now on Zoom, if one or two athletes pick up something from one session, then that's been a success. Um, and they'll, they'll grow they'll learn more as we go back to the same topic um, and they'll pick up more once they've developed and they realize actually that that makes sense this time yeah and it reminds me of the point you made earlier john where you said um even in a good program the best sort of the athletes who are going to make it will make it regardless and i guess those who are maybe going to make the most out of resources you send them like an interesting article or video are probably going to be the ones who click on it anyway so it's almost a self-selecting thing for the sort of better more committed people you might have in your program I think so, yes, yes. Okay, um, just an interesting point from Pauline, who, um, it's not a question, but just adds on to the fun aspect. She says, organised fun can be quite good at bringing in new shy squad members. Do you agree with that, John? I think it, I think that's a yeah, yes. really good point. This, this, this year we, um, we had a virtual uh, inaugural weekend for the squad, well, evening, <laughs> two hours, um, and we, we, we had a bit of a fun introduction there. And I was very impressed that all the youngsters who were probably 
you know, mm -hmm. be feeling a little bit out of the depth, kept, so took, participated and took part in it in a very sort of um, uh, open way. So, uh, yeah, um, I'm not sure how we'd, we could do something similar in future years when we have real weekends. Mm -hmm. again. Mark, I've got a question for John. Is that okay if I pipe in? Oh, absolutely. Please do. Jump in the queue, sorry. But I guess I'm always curious. You're talking a lot about the Scotch officer, those of you who don't know what it means. It's the Scottish juniors. So John is really involved with um, coaching a specific group of, of um, athletes. I, I think what I'm interested, John, is you've been in the game for so long. You were with a whole bunch of youngsters and you went up through that. What's your opinion about... You know, there's always the obvious athletes to work with. There's those who are the shining stars. You know, as teachers, you see them in the schools. You know, they're always the easier ones to work with in some ways because they're so motivated. But what about all the others that just don't stand out like that? How do you as a coach deal with that? Because it's, it's like, ooh, it would be easier to work with Sally or John because they're super motivated and they always do the training. But what about, um, you know, the other couples that actually need a bit more rallying? How do you deal with that yourself? Generally, in, in Scott Joss, most of the kids there are pretty motivated. You know, we're lucky with that. Um, I'm look at, looking out beyond that, looking back to some after-school clubs that I've been involved in, there was, we've had various kind of ADHD-type kids I think the parents want them to do something outdoors and burn off energy and so on. Um, and some of them have been a bit of a handful at times, but I get, I feel I get as much satisfaction from them continuing orienteering and enjoying themselves as I do from watching a superstar sort of cruising higher up the, uh, up the system. Um, and, uh, you know, personally, my, some of my most satisfying moments have been some of the, the, the real youngsters, the beginners, taking a step, a step up and maybe suddenly doing well in an orange course. Um, and I, I, I find that really satisfying. Okay, so I think five past, I think we'll move on. Uh, well, it's me next. So <laughs> I'm just gonna unspotlight on and then I'll share my screen. Okay, hopefully can someone confirm that uh, my PowerPoint's come up on the uh, screen. Cool. So I'm going to introduce myself. My name's Mark Nixon. I'm the Head of Performance Orienteering at the University of Edinburgh. Um, this is a programme that's been going quite some time before me. We had uh, Tony Lehisler, who's British Orienteering and Edinburgh coach. It's uh, funded by winning students and acts as a national performance centre within Scotland. I've been doing this for eight years. For the previous five years, I've also been the lead technical coach for the talent squad, the British Junior programme. Uh, and as of the last two weeks, I've also been the women's cross country and long distance coach uh, at the University of Edinburgh as well. As an athlete, I uh, started orienteering at a very young age, um, got into it through my family, was a member of Southampton Orienteering Club, and then moved into South Central Junior Squad, which at the time was very active, even had a third place in the interregionals, which is quite exceptional for such a small region. I was fortunate enough to go on pretty much every one of the sort of British orienteering tours um, from Lag and Lear onwards. I um, went to two Jaywalks and then moved into senior ranks, went to European championships and two world championships as well. Uh, similar to John, I started coaching alongside that. Um, my international career was essentially cut short by one of many significant injuries. Uh, and then I sort of moved full time into coaching, which is where I am now. So I'm gonna be talking about high performance coaching. And I realize this is uh, a very niche part of uh, sport in general and a very niche part of orienteering. And, and even within um, the UK, it's obviously a, a small, very small portion of the participants we have within our sport, but um, it obviously attracts a lot of resources. Um, and I think there's a lot of learning that can be generated and then can be passed down uh, into the, so the lower levels from what's going on um, at, at the top of the sport, really. So just so what is performance coaching? I found a very nice quote from Bill Bauman, who was the Oregon University of Oregon uh, cross-country and track coach, also one of the founding members of Nike. Um, 
if you have a body, you're an athlete. And the, the point I want to get across about this is, um, and I've already, I, I mentioned this at a, maybe a coaching or some BOF conference previously, that I don't really believe in this sort of, there's the elite and there's everyone else. I think uh, there's a spectrum. It's a continue that you don't suddenly just draw a line in this person's high performance and, and the person below them isn't it? It's very much a, a continuum. And, and there's just obviously at one end of that spectrum, there is the best in the world. And then you've got every single person beneath that. Um, but the point that I sort of follow through my coaching is there's the level at which people perform and there's the level of their attitude, which are two separate things, which is something which is quite important, but also it's just because this is, you know, useful for high performance athletes. It doesn't mean it's not useful for everyone else. It's just the stakes are higher. High performance athletes have more invested in it. And so they're going to more likely to do the smaller things, maybe the harder things that isn't necessarily going to be uh, something that motivates uh, maybe your club um, club athletes, but it's, it doesn't mean it's not something that can benefit them. And there's certainly there's, there's club athletes who do things uh, far better than, than performance athletes because to them, they, they find that it's worth it. Um, but really, I think it, it's just the same. Like the coaches are the same, athletes are the same. They might be faster, they might spend more time training, um, but really it, it's people who want to do their best. And coaches are people who should try to help the athlete do their best. Um, how you get there is obviously very different. What comes with a high performance environment is invested shareholders, metaphorically and literally. Now, the athlete's at the top. And, and hopefully we will understand that, that really the, the athlete is the center of coaching. That's the most important thing. They might not be the most knowledgeable. OK, so they need guidance and support. Um, but we are here to help them achieve their goals. It's not for us to decide their goals, but it's for us to, to help them achieve them. Um, there's obviously the coach. So at Edinburgh, that's myself. Um, pretty sure Interior obviously has, has several coaches in, in your club and regions, you'll, you'll have a number. There's the team. So this could be club. This could be national team, regional squad, whatever. And there's funding body. Now, each of these people are putting in, or each of these groups are putting in certain resources. It might be time, it might be money. And they might expect things in return. Okay, um, there are obvious issues with funding bodies and string, strings attached to the money that come with them, and, and that becomes a conflict. Um, coaches might put themselves before the athlete. Um, I, I've seen like examples of that. I can see it in athletics really quite quite clear where the coach is more interested in in how they look and they're willing to burn through as many athletes as they can to make themselves look like a good coach. And the same for teams. Um, if you look at the collegiate American model, athletes are a resource. If someone gets injured, it's next athlete up and, and they're big enough that they can do that. It's not good for the athlete. It's good for the team, but it's not good for the athlete. But in a small sport, unprofessional sport like us, we need to focus on the athlete because if we lose athletes. We just don't have the numbers behind them um, to, yeah, to, to follow them up with. But yeah, that brings us athlete-centered coaching. Um, interestingly, actually, I, like, the, I mentioned I just started cross country and, and track coaching. I actually took on two international athletes in the summer. Uh, one's a Scottish cross country international, another GB track international. And when I started working with them, one of the first things I said to them is like, the, these four points are the most important. Like, they need to be happy. They need to be healthy. Their training should be enjoyable and, and racing should become exciting. And I believe if you can get these four things right, success will follow now there's some caveats on, on how you you know how will that success follow they need opportunity they need guidance they need support but i think if any of these things start to deteriorate you're going to have problems sooner or later they might be able to motivate themselves to go through training even though they're not enjoying it they might be able to run through the pain um but but realistically if, if this is breaking down i think you're going to have problems and i think if you can focus on these four things actually everything else kind of looks after itself. Um, I, I do really have noticed that like, big problems come when, when this stuff starts to deteriorate. How you can keep on top of these things is very, very complicated and can't be done in 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but I think they're four things that are really important. Um, and, it, and it's the four things that I'd concentrate on to the point where I, I've had athletes, it's, it's, I've almost felt bad because I, I don't think athletes appreciate that this is more of a concern for me than their results. Um, I'm fortunate that I'm in a position where I'm not really going to get fired if they don't perform. Okay. If we come second at Bucks in British University Championships, like I, I, I'm still going to have a job at the end of the week. Um, 
but I think that sometimes they think that I need them to perform the whole time and and, and they've maybe been apprehensive about saying oh you know I, I don't want to run and stuff like that and I've had athletes come forward even quite recently saying I need a break and that's fine of course like go for it and and then once we've had that conversation letting them understand that to me that the health is way more important than than a medal um it, it's it's something that is I think really important to communicate to the athletes as well and it, it made me feel, feel glad at times I've had athletes ask other people to ask me to not run because they didn't want to have that conversation so it's you know it's obviously something that I need to improve in terms of communicating to them it's like these four things are the most important things if you train well if you're in a good environment and if you have opportunity success will follow so what's the role of a performance coach so some key areas so these shouldn't be categories that you've you've not really heard of okay so physical technical tactical there is a difference mental lifestyle and, and pastoral so in terms of what i have to do physically so i have a whole number of athletes and it's obviously managing their physical training um, we break this down we tend to work on a model week okay training isn't complicated endurance training is not complicated um, basically if you die by jack daniel's running formula that's everything you need to know about distance running and it's going to cost you 12.99 um, it's not easy but it's not complicated um, but we sit down and it's it's a conversation um, already my experience in track and field is athletes are used to just being dictated to and i don't think that's appropriate uh, I think they need to be involved. They need to have ownership of their program and, and I need to make sure it's appropriate for them. So I always bring them in. It's one-on-one. -on -one. We're making sure that physical program is, is right for them. We look at the previous training um, to make sure it, you know, it, it's going to be appropriate. And then we have regular discussions. Um, I've very much noticed that since we've been in lockdown, these little chats that I might have when we just meet in the gym or we're going for little runs or away on weekends, I'm much less aware of what my athletes are doing now because these little catch up conversations, which you don't even notice, just a little question here, little chats or things you over here in the minibus, you're not getting. Um, so it's, it's when we talk about communication later on, it's, it's, it's really quite important. Technical, obviously orienteering, we need to do our technique. So it's planning the sessions, shadowing them, um, doing talks afterwards, uh, pretty self-explanatory. And again, I'm not gonna spend time talking about the type of technical training we do, but it's something that I'm involved in. Tactical. Now, this might be actually preparing for races, and I think that's slightly different. So we'll have um, meetings before the JK, before the British Championships, before any internationals they're doing, before British universities. Um, we get together as a team. Anyone who has individual uh, concerns can come and see me as an individual as well. But it's about getting them ready um, sort of tactically and almost mentally in that sense as well, which is different to their techniques. Like, OK, you have solid technique, but how are we going to race uh, in Penn Hale, for example? And well, the answer is we're not. But um, but that's something that we spend a lot of time doing. Mental, um, this is a big thing. Your brain controls everything you do and it, it, it's huge to performance sport because there, there's undoubtedly a large amount of pressure. So it's something they, they do need to focus on. Um, unfortunately, we don't afford a psychiatrist or anything like that, but there's things we can do, which we'll touch on. Lifestyle, so this might be nutrition. This might be just time management, um, getting them through university. We need to make sure you know they pass their courses. It's important that actually outside of being an athlete, they, they develop as a person as well. Um, and this is sort of the overlap into partial as well. It's just helping them out as a person, helping them improve. I've gone through the system that they've gone through. I've made all the mistakes they're, they're going to make. So hopefully I can sort of see that they're heading down that path and, and, and stop them maybe making that same mistake. Um, but it's incredible that there's experience that I have and, and little bits of advice that to me would seem normal but for them it's something they've not heard because this is something i've seen 15 years in a row but for them it's something new um and you can never underestimate the, the sort of usefulness and power of just a small little piece of, of advice the whole time it could be something as simple as the way they tie their shoelaces um or you know teaching them that it's better to have always have decent food in the cupboard than empty cupboards you're more likely to have a better and better diet and things like that um so it's a whole range that i have to cover because all these things are going to make a difference. Know your limits. So I'm fortunate that I work within a, a much larger team at the university. We have a, a very large, over a million pounds, but 1.2 million pounds is what we spend on performance sport a year. Um, so we have strength and conditioning coaches. Um, we have physiotherapists. We have a mental skills coach who works with the teams, uh, works with us as a team. She works with individuals who need it and she works with me as well. So we, we, <laughs> I'm working with her just as much as the athletes are so I can improve as a coach. We also have someone who's an athlete lifestyle advisor. So, 
Again, she can deal with things like time management, how they're doing at university, uh, might be things, you know, problems at home, someone they can talk to. Um, and what I thought early on is I was so concerned that feeling like I had to know everything. And, and the more experience I've got as a coach, I realized it's like, there's no way you can know everything because I can't, you know, I can't be a qualified psychiatrist and a quali qualified physiotherapist and, and, and a full-time orienteering coach. Um, it's okay not to have the answer, but it is my responsibility to find the answer or direct them to it or find someone who can. And I think that's a really important uh, thing to consider. I also work with professional coaches in a whole bunch of other sports and I learn a lot from them as well. And I think that's a really in important thing is you can learn so much about coaching from outside orienteering. You could probably learn just as much from outside than you can from inside. And I, I spend a lot of time talking to other coaches in other sports and basically stealing their stuff because it's good stuff. Um, but yeah, learn from everyone, everyone that you can know what you do know. And it's more important that you know what you don't know as well. Some key points that I think uh, are good for effective coaching. I think it's very important that you and the athlete have clearly defined goals. What are we working towards? So then we can work together. Regular communication is absolutely critical. And I talked about that earlier, how in lockdown, I, I realized I don't speak to them as much. So trying to make a commitment to just sending them a message, how you're doing. Uh, obviously, I'll read their attack point, their training diaries, and if there's any issues, we talk about that. But having regular communication um, is really important. Having boundaries is quite important. I did actually get a message on Christmas Day saying my knee's a little bit sore, and about two minutes later saying, oh, we can talk about it another day, Merry Christmas, um, because they're so used to being able to just talk to me the whole time. And as a high-performance coach, I need to make myself available the whole time, basically 24 hours a day, pretty much, but that's, that's the job I'm in. I think the relationship needs to be based on trust. We need to trust each other, um, but we also need to respect each other and be honest. Um, there's two people you really shouldn't lie to in your life, your coach and your physiotherapist. Your parents and your partner, I'm not so fussed about, but the coach and physio need to know what's going on. Because if we're lied to, we can't help you. I need to know what's going on. I've had athletes try to play me against the physio against the snc coaches tell us all different stories thinking that we don't talk against each other talk talk to each other but it's really important that everything's out in the open because i'm here to help um i'm not here to judge um you might not get sympathy if something's going wrong but you'll get a solution and that's important growth mindset understanding that i can always improve things can always be dif differently um be open to to change and 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 how can we do things better each year how can we be better and the final point was, as a university, I'm not going to get the best out of the athlete. Orienteers probably mature between 25 and 30 years. And we're getting them from 18 up to sort of young, uh, early 20s. Um, and so I'm not here to get the best out of them, but I'm here to set themselves up for the rest of their career. And if after the four or five years, which is normal for Scotland, if after that, they don't need me as a coach, I've succeeded. I, I should be giving them the tools so they can go away. And all they need after that is probably a mentor, someone they can have conversations with, but really they have a good idea of what they're doing. Okay, um, any questions? Okay, anyone want to put some questions in the chat for Mark just quickly? Mark, do you mind just um, stop sharing the screen or maybe that's what you're doing right now? Yeah, I'm trying. Unfortunately, Zoom has, has completely disappeared. Like hey, there stop share there we go thanks um okay i have got a little question to start us off how specifically do you think that elite level coaching can apply further down the talent tree like what do you think that um it can apply to club members and and clubs yeah yeah i kind of talked about that at the start that i think actually you know like High performance athletes and normal athletes aren't so different. They're just invested slightly differently and maybe their outcomes are slightly different. But what, what we can learn from performance is quite a lot. So oh, what's a good example? So like nutrition, for example. Now, I want to educate my athletes. So good diet is going to be better recovery. Better recovery is going to be a reduced chance of injury. It's going to be uh, improved um, fueling. So improve performance as well. So, so that's obviously quite a good link. Okay. You, you need to fuel the body. Well, it's a racing machine. It needs to be properly fueled and the bad diet does lead to injury citation. You can go, go look that up or ask me for one and I can give you it. Um, but that doesn't mean like nutrition is something you know, coaches should know about nutrition. Maybe you have someone who's joined your club. Who's clearly they're living on Coca-Cola, Cadbury dairy milk and monster munch. 
and and that's that's not a good thing um so it's not about going this is going to make you 30 seconds quicker at the jk it's like this is going to stop your onset early diabetes this is going to maybe just make you feel more healthy um this might clear up your acne uh, and like nutrition is something that like transcends everything but the consequence of good nutrition is different for different people but like nutrition is really important sleep is another one um so for high performance athletes sleep better recovery and it's the same thing um athletes who have less than eight hours sleep are it's over 60 percent more likely to get injured um it, it, it is just massively linked towards recovery and injury um but like maybe if you're getting better sleep it's it's not going to again the, the, the participation club athlete it's like they don't care how they do it do it a race they may be doing it for fun but better sleep might just leads to maybe a better life they might be less grumpy you know they might just do do better at work um there's a whole bunch of skills that sort of we can learn things like dealing with pre-race anxiety right so pre-race stress you, your body detects a threat and then unfortunately like your autonomic nervous system kicks in your your fight or flight response kicks in and, and basically your sort of cave caveman instincts of, of, of fighting detects a threat and you get a response to that and so having the ability to deal with that is going to help you perform in a race right so that's what performance you know, dealing with rest, race anxiety how can you deliver on the day but maybe how can you deliver at school if, if we're teaching juniors in a club for example how to deal with pressure again yeah okay they might do better with the jk but maybe they've got a presentation at school they're feeling nervous for that yeah or, i'm gonna have to use a bit of a segue there for you with, just so that we can make sure that we can get denise's talking as well yeah uh thank you okay all right Okay, sorry to interrupt you there, Mark. That's right. Um, hello, uh, I'm Jen McKeown. Um, I was invited by Denise and the Scratch Orienteering Association to talk, so thank you for that. It's been my pleasure. Um, I've got a bit of a random background that brings me to this exact point. Um, I started out as a mathematician and then probably gave that up and became an outdoors instructor. And then got involved through working for the, for the military and for a couple of charities doing um, um, adventure development expedition so using adventure to develop life skills in people then off the back of that um i've started my own wee company orange body running leadership and life coaching essentially so i wanted to come on today to talk to you about how you could use life coaching to support yourself and or your athletes um specifically what is a life coach what's their job and then give you some wee examples for some context too Okay, so what is life coaching? I want to offer you that despite the really vague title of life coach, uh, you're probably all doing some element of life coaching in your coaching already. And kind of Mark and John have just illustrated that. Such as mindset, attitude, nutrition, as Mark was just saying, sleep, study skills. So there's a lot of potential for life coaching and to complement what sports coaching is already doing and vice versa. So some key questions that I offer you today. How can my life support my sporting success, which was mostly what Mark's touched on as well. And then something that is a personal interest to me, how can lessons that I've learned from sport help me succeed in life? Um, I guess which of these questions is most relevant to you or your athletes probably determines at what level you're at or what stage in life you're at or just generally also what your values and priorities are. Um, a life coach is someone who can help you explore these questions. Um, the benefits of a life coach is that we're impartial. So I will rarely care what your competition scores or outcomes are, unless you particularly care what your competition outcomes are. But I'll care in the, in the context that those, those outcomes and you working towards them is ecological in the terms of your personal values, your life choices and just the things that are generally going on for you. Um, yeah, so from my point of view, uh, a great coaching session is one where I've not said very much, or sorry, yeah, I've not had to say very much, but being able to listen completely to what's going on for you and then ask some questions that can get you to think, okay, are the actions that I'm taking in line with the things that are important to me. All right, what is the job of a life coach? So I see myself as having two hats 
the educator hat and then the professional asker of questions. Um, the educator hat relates back to some of the things that Lynn was talking about. Um, loads of things get missed off the school curriculum, as I'm sure you, you know, that would be really helpful to know. Um, and the things that I concentrate on is, is stuff like how does the human brain work? Like not just not necessarily big, massive psychology lesson. This is the biology of it. But what is going on from the fact that it is a biological thing that's causing me to think, act, behave the way that I do? Um, how do thoughts work? Where do thoughts come from? How do thoughts affect me and drive my behavior and affect my sporting performance, sporting interests, all those things? How can I shape my thoughts so they're useful? How can I release myself from negative thoughts and enhance positive ones? Um, other education stuff, exploring different styles of thinking, looking at the stress response in detail. Um, so life stress and physical stress, I'm sure everyone on this call knows how important those two are together. And in fact, I actually find the concept of good stress versus bad stress is actually easier to explain that to an athlete or someone that's got an athletic background because they're just so much more familiar with it. Um, and that's a great example to me, a really simple example of how lessons from sport can feed back into life. Um, in terms of the professional asker of questions hat, that's more a case of one-to-one -one tailored questioning, um, more guided helping a person figure out how specifically they can apply the education things to their life and to the specific things that they've got going on. Um, even for someone who's trained in life coaching, it can sometimes be much easier to have an impartial, independent person who's not clouded by any of the emotion that that they're dealing with to just ask questions and encourage us to think and reflect on like okay does this actually make sense what I'm doing in terms of what I've set out that I'm trying to achieve. Um, human beings have a tendency as I'm sure you're all aware to go to black and white thinking especially when there's a bit of emotional stress on the go and I see one of my main roles as a life coach is to help people um, navigate the grey space. Um, a really basic example of that just to show what I mean is for example you wake up one morning and okay I'm gonna go for a run today or I'm either not gonna go for a run today and obviously I'd really like to go for a run because it contributes to me running more but I can't be bothered instead of seeing it as those two black and whites honestly like what's the middle ground I could go for a walk and do some push-ups better than nothing but taking that big example and applying that to the sorry the small example and applying it to some of the bigger things going on in life um yeah, so it's trying to avoid getting locked into certain thought patterns. And then if you take that to a larger process, um, what fundamental things am I believing about myself or thinking or your athletes are believing about themselves or the way that the world works around them that's inhibiting or encouraging their potential? Um, yeah, so those are the grounds of the professional asker of questions hat of being a life coach. Okay, how can, coach, how can life coaching help? So I see it as a life coaching job, again, two levels here. We've got strategic questions, but the really important part that stops it just being like um, super woolly is the best way to describe it, is that that then has to be turned into some kind of tactical action that you can go out. So the strategic questions are the big questions in life, like who am I, where am I going, what am I doing? What's the point in this? Why am I turning up to training? Why am I going to, why am I doing orienteering? Why am I coaching? Why am I volunteering? Um, and why are those important to the athlete? Um, it's reduction in stress, basically. So if we can make sure that those big questions that maybe don't come up every day, but are lurking at the back of our heads, if they're all lined up with the things that we're actually doing, our life is more enjoyable, it's, more stre it's less stressful even, and um, it's easier to stay motivated, enthused, focused, um, yeah, so I see my job as helping someone look at those questions and then turn it into something actual tact actually tactical. So I want to achieve this thing. Literally, what does that look like in my life? What are the steps that I have to go through to put that together? Um, and one of my one of the things that comes up most commonly in coaching questions, OK, I know I should be doing this thing and I want to do this thing. I can see that it's beneficial to me. And yet I'm not. And helping people figure out 
okay, what is it that's stopping you from doing that thing? What else could you do? Could you achieve the same outcome a different way that works better for you and helping people work through that kind of problem solving process. Um, okay, so I just wanted to, I was trying to think recently to um, athletes or people who've got athletic backgrounds that I've coached recently to give you some examples. So please allow me to do so. Uh, the first one that came to my mind was um, a man who, he, he enjoyed running and not not professional running, but wanted to, to get better at running, but was struggling because he would had also recently got engaged and wanted to spend his weekend pushing himself running, yet also wanted to go running with his new fiance who didn't run at the same level. And he was having all those weird guilt feelings. So sitting down and chatting with him about what was important and then coming up with a strategy that could work for him as to how he was going to navigate this. Um, another example was a mountain athlete who he felt that he was stuck at stuck at the at a certain performance, like a plateau essentially. And out of conversation with him, sure, it turned out that he needed to develop technical skills of which I was not qualified to help him with. But that was kind of obvious to him. The problem that he was suffering was that he wasn't even because he felt so unclear of what he was trying to do why he was trying to do it and what was important about it to him. He was struggling to even engage with getting someone to help him with the technical skills. He was struggling to even get himself to get in the car, to go to the mountains at the weekend to get some experience in. Um, another example completely different is um, another man who was working on his sports club committee and helping him navigate some of the uh, social and leadership dynamics that were coming through there, which um, turned out to be super complex, but putting the, really trying to get him to stick with the idea of playing the ball and not the man and avoiding getting drawn into emotions, just, just staying quite like, this is what I'm trying to achieve. And it's, yeah, so just coaching him through those, those processes. And then of course, COVID has created all kinds of weird things. So for example, um, people who their income have dried up and now they're suddenly, okay, why am I doing this sport? Am I still interested in this sport? And feeling, especially if it's been quite a big part of their identity, feeling like a lot of confusion and stuff coming through there. And how, okay, so your income's changed. How can we now change the way that you can show up in your sport so you can still enjoy yourself? Um, yeah, so that was a pretty rapid fire summary of what it's like to be a life coach and hopefully has given you some insight. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. And thanks again to Denise and Scott Shorey and Tiran for inviting me to chat. Thanks, Jen. But great. Um, I'm looking at if there's any chats in there. I've got a question that I'd love to ask you, and that is, what are the challenges and rewards that you find with being a life coach? Mm. Um, I think it's super rewarding. Um, I think it's a really great privilege to be trusted with people to talk about things. I think it's a great privilege to be able to talk with things about the big questions in life. Um, it's really intellectually stimulating as well because I have to put my own, the own way, the way that I see the world, I have to kind of put that aside and then put my brain into just listening to what they're saying and trying to understand that. And that just like fires my brain. That's cool. Uh, the challenges are that the outcome can sometimes be quite hard to quantify. So it's hard to say I did X and it achieved Y in this for this person. Um, another challenge is that it's an unregulated industry and it's an industry with a terrible reputation as well. So that can be when when meeting new people, there's definitely an element of like you have to demonstrate that you're worthy of trust and that you, you can actually provide value. It doesn't just automatically come because you're, I don't know, level three, whatever. So that can be challenging. But overall, I think it's super rewarding. Great, thank you. Hey, I wonder if you could stop sharing your screen. Oh, sorry, yeah. That's okay. Um, and there's one more question here I'm gonna ask, I will ask before we move on, if that's okay. Um, you mentioned physical and life stress. Do you think of these as different items? or is having the same effect? Oh, interesting. Um, I guess it depends. Um, I heard a great quote recently that everything in life is how we explain it to ourselves. Um, 
I probably I feel like probably this is a better question for Mark or John. Um, it depends on the person. What from my experience, it depends on the person that you're dealing with and how they portray it. But do you know what? I can't even answer that that fully because it seems so interlinked and so dependent on the context of the physical stress and the life stress. Um, yeah, that's a bit. Mm -hmm. of a I've got a good quote, which is um, where the mind go, the legs will follow. Yeah. Um, and that works in confidence when you're feeling strong, the legs are good. But when you're mentally exhausted, the legs go there. I, I, they're definitely linked. I, in fact, stress can be more tiring than training for sure. Definitely. It is very strongly interlinked. Excellent. Well, thanks, Jen. That's really amazing. I love, love listening to that. I'm, I'm going to try to get my shared screen up right now. See what I can do there. Mark, you had a hand, you think, of putting people on spotlight. That was, a qu I actually not used that before. Um, so when I go, could you put me on spotlight? I don't think it's something I can do for myself. I'm just bringing out my presentation, sorry, everybody. And my young son showed me how I can put it in presenter view because that's quite good. So um, hang on a second. No, I've totally lost it. I need to get in shared screen. You think I've done this a million times, but share. Now, is that working? Can we see that? Can somebody give me a thumbs up or tell me if that's working? Yeah, that's good. Yes, good. yeah. What is a coach? Big question for me. Well, I'll have to admit fully that I don't see myself as a coach at all. I'm, I don't consider myself a coach. I don't do any coaching. Um, I don't have a coaching background. In actual fact, I had a great, um, just a bit of background for you. Um, I spent many, many years from when I was 18 until into my 50s um, working as an outdoor guide and instructor. When I was 17, I did some rock climbing at an outward bound school in British Columbia, and I remember being on the rappelling wall and saying to myself, if I can make my living off of doing this, I'm going to be the happiest person for the rest of my life. So that was my big goal, just to be outdoors, um, get my um, exercise from my work. And the other rule of thumb I've always gone by, and I still do, if I have to get dressed up and go to, the, go to an office, um, the fanciest dress I need to wear are my jeans. So I've maintained those three. Um, goals and it served me fairly well, I'd say. Um, but what is a coach? It's an interesting question for me, given I'm in the role of coaching and volunteer officer for Scottish Orienteering. Um, I come in um, as, a, as a person who's done a lot of guiding, um, guiding really long, big, crazy trips and crazy places. Um, I've done it for many years. I've been an instructor, um, taking people to some pretty remote locations. So I don't see myself as a coach, but as a guide. Um, guiding people to help them, um, you know, imagine their dreams. Um, the North Pole Women's Expedition in 97, and again last year going to the South Pole with the Malaysian women's team. I mean, imagine that there's no snow in Malaysia, and these women have this dream of going to the South Pole. Uh, the North Pole women, they had no skill whatsoever in, in that environment. I mean, who really would? Um, None of them really could ski. They certainly had never been in anything colder than a British winter. And, um, you know, they really, you'd say to yourself, what is it and why do they want to do this? Well, the thing that linked certainly both of these um, expeditions and these teams was that they had a common goal and they had this dream. They really wanted to go do this and they made it happen for themselves. And so I saw my role and I still see my role as a facilitator for people, um, you know, who, who have these dreams and these desires to just develop the skills that they need um, to get to these places that they want to go. Um, so an important element for sure um, is to have um, building skills, um, sharing, um, um, building skills and sharing um, common goals and, and, and instilling trust. Um, you know, you're going to find yourself or we're going to find ourselves in crazy situations such as um, the image of crossing these big open leads. We certainly had to work together well. Um, it was a, a, a common just sort of need to survive and want to get through these experiences um, that, that binded us all together. So important elements are skills, working together, developing as a team um, and just having ownership and being out there. Um, so again, just my role in 
um, guiding people through to develop this. Um, certainly in a situation like this, um, when the shit hits the fan, you know, we can't always be prepared for hard times. You can't always be prepared for when you don't want to go out and train or when you've not had a good race or when you didn't get chosen for that squad. But, you know, it, you just need to have a mindset to know that not everything is going to go right all the time, but what do you do um, when it's not going your way? Well, you, you rally yourself, you, you find the confidence, you get through it um, and you keep moving on. So um, this particular image is, um, is one that I still remember very much. It was falling through the ice in the Arctic Ocean. And, uh, you know, we certainly didn't want to be there, but we found ourselves there. And um, as a team, we certainly worked ourselves through um, what could have been uh, completely the end of a, a very um, expensive and interesting trip to um, continuing moving on and getting to the North Pole. So, you know, working together, um, developing the skills to get through hard times. Um, this image for me, just know your athletes and get the best from them. I spent more years than I can really remember working with sled dogs. And it was in the earlier years, in my early 20s and into 30s, um, I worked with dogs that were on the Iditarod and the Yukon Quest. Um, had a team of 40 dogs at one time. I you know, crossed Baffin Island with some dogs. I, I, they were basically my life for many years. And I learned a lot about working with people from working with sled dogs. Um, basically what they kept telling me, I mean, I wasn't particularly, and I still wouldn't say I'm particularly good dog musher. You know, I'm a bit impatient. Um, I kind of want everything to go well all the time. And I, you know, I really didn't listen to the dogs well enough for, the, for, me, to, for me to understand what was it that they needed, you know, where in that line of dogs did they want to be? You know, I might've been putting one up at the front or one at the back and in actual fact, that wasn't what they had to give. They had um, a different set of skills to give to that team. Um, what was fascinating working with sled dogs is it really is and does epitomize um, how that individual athlete can create an incredible working team. And if you can work with those individuals and get the best from them, meaning nurturing them to be the best that they can, then you've got this unbelievable team that can really um, go long distances and win big races or just have an incredible day out um, um, moving um, through an amazing environment. Um, um, and last but not least, just sort of the idea of a dream. You know, I, Lynn mentioned it early in her chat. It's really important for, I, I think, in speaking to the coaches that are involved with this session um, and for myself that the athletes and the coach have a dream and you want to be able to move forward through that dream. What is that dream or what's the common goal and how do you put one foot in front of the other to reach that and attain that and also then to push through and continue to you know, look forward and, and build that dream. Um, I love this image. It really, to me, shows just an incredible environment moving forward to an, a horizon that's open to lots of possibilities. Um, so, um, you know, that's really all I would like to add and wanted to share with you um, about sort of my insight into to guiding people and, and um, developing uh, the individual to create an amazing working team. So thanks very much for that. I will stop sharing the screen. It's I've got a, a question. Um, so <laughs> when you fell through quick. the ice, yeah, I was going to say, what do you think about <laughs> your learning from like the unpredictable is like? Yeah, I mean, it's not about, it's about not getting rattled for one. It's trying to keep calm and cool. The um, always be cool type of attitude. Um, but preparedness is incredibly important. Um, the unexpected is going to happen. I mean, look what's happened to us over this last year and a half. So do we have it within us to be um, for dealing with um, a pretty naughty situation. Um, I'm, yeah. And in that particular situation, follow through the ice, it was, um, thank God my parents taught me um, that learn, being a strong swimmer was really important. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Okay. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So Lynn, um, you're going to wrap up for us. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to just say my thanks to everybody now because Lynn's going to um, do the final um, wrap up for us. But thanks, everybody, for attending and adding your bits. And thank you for all the uh, panelists. It has been lovely to hear the different perspectives. It's been really interesting. Thank you very much.
and over to you, Lynn. Okay, thanks very much then for your talk, Denise, and a window into the life you had before you came to live in the north of Scotland and be our coaching and volunteering officer for Scottish Orienteering. Tonight we've had 60 on the call, which I think is, you know, quite amazing. And thank you for your time for this. The title of the session was What is a Coach? So we've heard some snapshots about athlete centered coaching. Um, taking it forward into, you know, just rather than just athlete-centred coaching, people-centred coaching. We've seen an interesting window into what a couple of coaches actually do. And life coaching and how it links with sport and looking at the person, you know, so people have come very much to the fore tonight. And finally from Denise, you know, helping others to reach for their dreams. So the position, the passion for coaching or facilitating learning in others has actually come through from all the panelists tonight. Just like to leave you with a couple of thoughts. What are your takeaways for tonight? When we come off the call, what are you going to reflect on? And at the moment, my takeaway is from what Jen was saying and something that, you know, I will try and ensure I do. Don't say much listen and ask questions. A lot of the time, we actually talk too much. So do we make the most of our opportunities or do we concentrate on the challenges? And COVID has given us the opportunities to actually have this virtual conference this year. And if you think of the numbers that we've had, and I'm sure Peter could back this up from British Orienteering, it's far more than would have ever been able to travel for a weekend away to a coaching conference somewhere. So we've reached out to many, many more people. And I think, you know, that has shown that we can take opportunities when it just looks like there are challenges. And I think, you know, that's most of what I've, we've got to say tonight. And thank you for your attention and your time. And I don't have to say safe journey, which is really rather nice. <laughs> Excellent. Anything else to add, John, Jen, Mark? Nope. Great. Thank you very much. You wrap it up very well. And everybody, take care. Thank you for joining us this lovely Tuesday evening. And I believe this is the last session for the British Ontarian Coaching Conference. Um, Peter, you've you've done a fantastic job um, putting things together. So thanks for that. And good night, everybody.